everyone. This is John Fennick with the Fennick Commodities Report. I'm back with our monthly conversation with Don Durrett, founder of goldstockdata.com and uh, author on gold and silver and related. So, Don, welcome back. Hey, let's do it again, John. <laughs> We're also going to have in about 20 minutes time Michael Williams with us, who is the uh, founder of Aftermath Silver, as well as Vendetta Mining. And uh, I'm very excited to have him on. Both companies have... Um, you know, been a little light on the news recently, which is not unusual after Beaver Creek and Denver, as you know, Don, we kind of reach a slow point sometimes in Q4. And so I like to get, you know, CEOs like like Michael involved so that people that have stock can keep the stock because I think we're really um, at a point now where we, we you know, we, we last interviewed in September. Of course, we have a, a lot to talk about uh, either on this show and or the next show about Israel and the impacts of what that's going to mean for our sector, gold and silver. But clearly, gold has responded immediately October 9th to what it could become a much broader um, conflict, don't you think? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, yeah, I Israel kind of changed the whole tone for gold. Uh, we already had... Um, you know, gold's been as a three-year correction. And gold, you know, I thought even without this war was going to, you know, break out here and that the markets were going to break down. I so I, I kind of made that call in late late August that I was expecting the SP to retest 4200 in September and then crash in October. Well, they haven't crashed, but we did go below 4,200 in October uh, this week, actually. We haven't yep. crashed, but um, Israel is the reason why. So I said that gold would go. I thought that gold would retest 1,800. It hasn't yet. Came really close um, because of this war. And then it went up uh, Almost, I, I don't think it touched two thousand, but like one hundred and ninety dollars, one hundred and eighty dollar move in two weeks from the war. So the 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 Israel war is actually is, you know, adding to this this fear trade that I said is coming, and you know, Luke Groman, he's really been pounding the table about the bond market being in trouble here, and that's part of the risk. And I just think that Wall Street has it wrong, this idea that the economy is going to come back, you know, this soft landing um, theme. I just think that's way off base and that the risk levels are going to explode. So even though, you know, even without the war, I think that we were we were going into a recession and the risk trade was coming. So this war is just speeding it up. It's adding to the risk, which is unbelievable. I mean, we could talk about that for an hour, all these uh, all these issues that have changed you know, especially since COVID and since, you know, the Ukraine war. And so now we got two wars going on. You know, it's amazing. Ukraine war is like in the backseat. They're not even on the front page anymore, but that war is still going on. But right. We don't know if this, this war in, in Israel is going to expand, but I think it has a chance of that happening. And that's the reason why gold's so high here is because of that possibility is just lingering there. And it's kind of putting a floor under gold. And so we don't know here, can that war, if it does expand, does that push gold over 2,000? One thing I've changed is I've basically, because I do think the war will expand and it will last a, last a while here, it's creating a lot of you know risk in the Middle East, and especially on oil. We don't know what oil is going to do. Mm. Um, so we have these underlying factors that are, on top of all these other things going on. And so it's, I don't think gold's going to break down here. It, it, to, as of today, I would say that my range is 1825 to 1870. I, okay. I, I don't think gold's going below 1870, eight, below 1825. So if that's the case, then the lows are in. And I, I was saying buy to the bottom. So you, you basically miss that if you weren't buying to the bottom, if, if you did, you know, buy some of these stocks that, you know, a lot of them are, you know, at least 5% off the bottom. A lot of
I don't think I don't think those lows are coming back. But you right now, good time to buy still. Your turn. Okay. So yeah, there um I agree with pretty much everything you just said there. I would I would just add that when you look at some of the juniors, you know, moving five or ten percent here, like off of let's say October 9th lows, who cares, right? Like that's my my thesis. It's it's like aftermath what we're gonna hear from in a few minutes was trading at I think about a buck forty US. It's trading at 13 cents today. It's still 90% plus off. It's three year high. So like you're not missing anything. The idea that I've been talking out there, Don, on recent podcasts is that I don't get entry points right all the time, right? But one thing that I do really well is I keep talking to CEOs like Michael and, and making sure that my thesis isn't broken, which is really important, as you know, because all the time you have to keep on top of companies. You do a great job of that, tracking like 900 companies. I don't even know how you do it, but you do do a great job of it. Your site's amazing. And I'm tracking about 200 names and it's just about all I can handle, you know, and the, the long and short of it is you don't have to track 900 or 200 companies, everyone. You just have to pick 20 to 50 names and get behind those names and buy them multiple times if the conviction is still there, right? If the thesis is broken and something has changed, say, you know, um, First Nations issues or a roadblock or a strike or something that's going to cause you know, problems for months, right? Then yes, I mean, walk away, take a loss or take a small gain and move on to something else. There's just plenty of things on sale right now. Um, but getting back to what you said, Don, you know, I thought it was really interesting in the State of the Union with Biden talking about Poland and Taiwan. Like, I mean, I was like, what are you, you know, this guy's got no filter at all. And it, it's it's interesting because no one has Poland and NATO on their radar anymore, like you just alluded to. It's like, what happens if Russia makes that a bigger conflict? Oh my gosh, you know, it's like then gold makes an all-time high literally within a week, I think, um, because that's not in anyone's playbook right now. Um, mentioning Taiwan was sort of off base, I thought, but also there's been tons of rhetoric around Iran. I don't know if you saw today, Turkey's, you know, Erdogan is talking up tough talk against Israel. It's like, man, people are like kicking sides here and these are some serious you know, world powers we're talking about. Not as strong as the U.S., of course. And we've got our USS Gerald Ford just sitting there waiting for any conflict and hopefully sending a powerful message to the Middle East. But we're, we'll see what happens here. I mean, this is a fluid situation, everyone, and you've got to stay on top of it. Right. Um, another thing that I, I wanted to talk about as far as macro goes is the bond market because, you know, interest rates... People didn't expect interest rates, the 10-year bond, to go to 5%. That was kind of an outlier. And, and the reason why it went there is because supply, the Fed basically hasn't been buying bonds. So without the Fed in there buying bonds, the long-term rates have went up. And that's the big outlier. And that's you know the reason, I think a big reason why the markets are down below 4,200 here is because of rates. Yeah. Well, so... This is where it gets interesting. So I've been saying that the Fed made a mistake by raising rates too fast, too high, and they should have stopped a long time ago. And now, and they they wouldn't basically pass, you know, the point of no return where they can't they can't bring it back in. And you know, Luke Grom was using this idea of the the horizon, the investment horizon. We we basically we went past it, kind of the point of return, the investment horizon. It's like it, now you 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 can't recover from it. He's saying that if they if they don't bu start buying bonds and 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 start adding throwing more liquidity in, expanding the dollars, that there's just not enough. There's there's too much supply of bonds and rates are going to keep going higher. And and then on the other side, if they do start printing money, if they basically turn off the QT right now then that's not going to fix the problem either because then inflation is basically not going away. And, Correct. and so as inflation doesn't go away, that causes its own problems. And yeah. Then, and see, I think, I ahead. think the fed has just gone too far as well, but I do think they're with inflation in that three and a half to four range right now, they're not going to back down and start cutting rates. Like so many people think right away. I mean, the November 1st meeting is completely off the table. There's a 1% probability of a hike. 
But if you look at December, it's about a 20% probability down from about 25% earlier this week. Yeah. Um, and the, the J January meeting is about 27% probability right now of a quarter point hike. So is that going to be destructive? No, but it's not going to be good for the overall market. To your point, we're already stretched. Um, but I do think that the Fed is going to keep an eye on these metrics. And what we're not factoring in is what we just talked about at the onset is like, what happens if things get really wide um, in this conflict and bring in other other players um, the Fed could use that as an excuse, right, to get involved. And and so I don't think that's factored into prices. That's why I'm trying to teach my followers and clients, like, don't get too cute with these entry points. You're going to make a mistake about the first buy. Just accept it, right? Buy a second, third, fourth, fifth time, and then lower that average cost, and then, you know, be positioned for a nice move, I think. Right. Um, now, going back to this bond theme, I really believe the Fed's done. Uh, they can't okay. rate rates any further and that they will cut rates by June at least 1% and probably one and a half is my expectation. And the reason why they will do that is they have, they cannot let this thing get out of control. Um, especially we get a, we get two, a two pronged problem, which I think is going to unfold here. You know, prong number one is basically high rates on the long end. And the high, those high rates in the long end are going to be very damaging to the economy. Absolutely. And, and when you go into a recession, if you go back to, I think that the fear levels from 2008 are coming back. Mm -hmm. and, and if you remember back in 2008, the Fed was just totally paranoid about a market meltdown. Oh, yeah. Right? So I, I think that's coming back. And once that fear comes into the Fed, they're, they're going to cut. And like I said, I'm expecting the Fed funds to be about three and a half by June. So I, I do not expect them to raise. And, and, and once they start lowering rates, this is actually good for gold. And it's actually very bad for the stock market because historically, whenever the Fed cuts rates, they're cutting rates for the wrong reasons and the markets are falling. Markets fall when you cut rates initially. They don't go up. You, you got to get, you don't get a bottom. You don't bottom the stock market doesn't bottom until the recession. And we have, the recession hasn't even started yet. So a lot of people are getting their news from the mainstream media and the business business cycles. These are people that are in the industry. They make money managing money. And they're not going to tell you what, you know, what I'm saying here, these, these high risk levels, because if they do, it just, you know, it feeds on, you know, the selling. They 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 spin it. Today on the halftime show, they did not talk about the technicals on you know the S and P five hundred. If you for a reason, they didn't mention it at all. And we just passed a very important the two hundred day moving average, right? And the next one is the right. two hundred week moving average, which is thirty nine fifty. And that's yeah. that to me is the final line in the sand. You got four forty one hundred, four thousand, and then thirty nine fifty, and they're not that far away. You go below 3950. I tweeted this. You get below that level, and it's kind of Katie by the bar the door situation. But the market hasn't bounced since. It's probably not going to bounce there either. Let's talk about that too in more detail because you and I talked about this very thing on our last interview. If people want to check it out on my YouTube channel, Fed and Commodities Report, Don and I got into this and said this very thing. If you break the 200 day moving average, which was at that time around 4200, 4210. Then you're going to bring in a test of 4,000 in a big round number, right? And so Don is now giving you some more specifics about 3950 being that kind of level right now. It ch changes every day, everyone. So you have to keep on that. But what we what we both said last time was that the Fed is not going to have your back at 4,200, right? And we said you're not the Fed's not going to have your back at 4,000. And these people that are generalist investors really believe you know, a lot of them believe wholeheartedly that the Fed will have their back at these levels because we topped out at 4,800 plus, right? Like that's a long drop. No, they're not going to have your back, people. Um, that's that's what's different this time is that the Fed means business and they're gonna they're not gonna just, you know, have your back because, because Powell and the entire group of these, you know, the 19 people are gonna look like fools if they back off right now because the market's down a little bit. But look at how quickly the action has changed, Don. I mean, yesterday... 
Then I watched the S&P right at that 4,200 level. It did hold in there for a couple hours and then faded it. And then today you had a nice spike down again, just breaking through resistance. Like, you know, um, I don't see too many people talking about this like you and I are talking about it. I see a lot of people talking about all-time highs, but it is very real now. Um, I also talked on a podcast yesterday that the Russell 2000, which is the IWM, um, has let us down in the 0809 crisis. It also let us down in September of 2018. And right now it's breaking down again. The Russell 2000 is not something that I have ever gone along in because of those 2000 stocks, over a thousand of them trade very little volume. And so when you are a portfolio manager or a financial planner, you're putting that Russell 2000 sleeve in a lot of client portfolios, right? Because it, it gives you access to the small cap market, right? It's an easy way to do it, but it's also very liquid. So I would just caution people to, you know, look at your 401k allocations right now. It's not too late to kind of just rethink some things. And also you probably have a stable value uh, or money market option for sure in your 401k menus. Talk to your financial about advisor about that because the stable value portfolio generally yields somewhere between, you know, three and 6% with very, very little risk. So that's, you know, what I would be doing right now is rethinking that, hey guys, you know, we've had a run from March of 2009, a very accommodative Fed, you know, things are now 14 and a half years down the road and, you know, take some risk off the table here if you're, you know, if your menu has to be long at your um, 401k or 403b plan. And if not, you know, Don and I are both short financials. Uh, we talked about that last time. That's worked out even better now. Um, I, you know, have shorted a lot of international ETFs since January of last year, you know, and I remain short all of those because now it's like go time. You know, now the world is in a show me kind of phase, I think, Don. That means, you know, overseas stocks. It's like if you can't work your way out of this malaise that we're seeing in this conflict, then how are international stocks going to thrive in this environment? Right. So I think that, you know, if we do go below 3950 here, and if we go below 4000, it's going to be really hard not to test that 3950. If we do go below that 3950, I think what's next is. 3000 to 3500 which is basically a crash. Wow. Yeah. I don't know I don't know how long it's going to take to get down there. It could could take all the way till, you know, the middle of Q2. Uh, you know, we're not going to go to 3000 this year. We might not even make it to 3500 this year. It depends on, you know, what happens, how fast is the selling happens. But I do think that between now and say April, May, somewhere in there, we'll get a we will get a bottom here. And what people are really missing is that the stock market rallied from this time last year. It basically, if you look at the stock market, I mean, it just basically went straight up from late October all the way until August. And yep. I always felt that that was a dead cat bounce because the economy was slowing and the Fed was still raising rates. It was This was not a recovery. Stock markets don't make these kind of runs unless it's a recovery. And this didn't feel like a recovery at all. It always felt like we were heading into a recession. Now, the stock market is not priced in for a recession. It's pr priced in for a soft landing. Right. And when Wall Street realizes that, uh-oh, we're going to have a recession, and it, it, trust me, they're not talking about it. So once they, yeah. once they basically say, uh-oh, we got a recession, um, at that point, that's when these three these numbers come into play. This three thousand to thirty five hundred comes into play. Um, so, I keep in, you know watch the macro, watch the negative data, watch you know what can what can possibly take this thing back up. Even if the war ends, uh, you know, in two weeks in Israel, is that enough to get this market going again? I don't think it. I don't think it is. So. He's, all the data right now is pointing towards a recession, pointing towards lower, in my opinion, the odds are pointing towards that lower market. And then gold will eventually benefit from that. It, mm -hmm. We don't know when that will happen, when that decoupling happens. But and the way that gold could benefit is 
is a whole different conversation, which is pretty amazing. And the reason why I've been doing this for 20 plus years is because of the U.S. bond market. The U.S. bond market is everybody recognizes this, that ultimately it's going to have a problem. But people have always pushed this, kicked this down the curb saying, oh, it's two years, five years, 10 years down the road. We don't have to worry about it. Well, guess what? We're just about there. We're getting really close. Totally agree. And maybe on our next interview, uh, we could talk a little bit about you know how much U.S. Treasuries China has sold at that point, because I know they're selling pretty heavily and buying gold um, with that money, right? And um, if you look at the TLT right now, which is the 20-year ETF, um, it, it hit a 16-year low this week. So to Don's point, you know, the bond market is is not looking wonderful. And then what are your alternatives? Cash, the U.S. dollar and gold, really. And, you know, uh, we, we, we don't want to get down Don on start on the U.S. dollar. But, you know, um, we, we basically, you know, are seeing what Rick Rule had talked to me about when I worked at Sprott, which is since the 1970s, you do have periods of time where gold and the U.S. dollar will run up together. And that's what we're seeing right now. You know, it's it's there's a it's sort of like the world is split almost 51 to 49 percent. Some people are buying the Momo still you know, figures crossed that this is all going to work out. And then you've got some other people that, you know, are pretty smart as well, buying conservative investments and safe havens. And, and you know, clearly um, I'm willing to take some risk with, you know, some stocks. But, you know, it's it's got to be with the understanding that they're in the right part of the market. And so with that, uh, Don, why don't we leave the macro there if you're if you're OK with that? I have one quick add on to finish sure. up. We'll be done with macro. And, and I wanted to talk a little bit about just Japan and China on their bonds. OK. Um, a lot of people don't realize this, but um, China hasn't added to their bonds in 10 years. If you go and look at the chart, they had more they had owned more U.S. bonds 10 years ago than, than they do. If you look at it, it's basically been a decline for 10 years. It's been a long time now. They're down to 800 billion. At one time, they were almost at 1.1 trillion. So they're down right. to 800. And I've always said that once they get down to below 700, and I don't think it'll be longer now, that Japan would have to start selling because Japan has over a trillion and they don't want to be the bag holder. If China gets out of all of their treasuries, then Japan's like the last guy standing and they don't want to look foolish. That's if for sure. China really looks smart. Point. If China looks smart by selling all their bonds, J Japan goes, we got to sell too. We can't be look like the fool. And that's the one thing about Asian culture. So they have this concept called face where you don't want to embarrass yourself. Mm -hmm. Embarrassment is one of the worst things in, in the Asian culture. <laughs> they don't want to be embarrassed. And so they will sell. They will do the logical thing. That's one thing about Orientals. They're very logical. And they will, Japan will sell. Now, they have, my final thought on this is that the yen right now is at 150. And the word on the street is that's the line in the sand, that Japan doesn't want to go above that. So in order for them not to, they got to sell. So it's almost two factors pushing Japan into selling bonds. So Japan's no longer going to be a buyer. China's not a buyer. Those, those were our two biggest holders of bonds. So now we have this huge supply coming in. Um, because we have basically a $2 trillion deficit. So you have this huge supply coming in, and who's going to buy them? And so the bond market is is in big trouble here. And if, if the Fed just keeps expanding their balance sheet, if they switch off, right now they're in QT mode, but if they switch to QE, start buying these bonds, um, you know, it's going to create some issues. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's it. No, that's great, Don. Excellent point there. And Let's talk about that more when we get together uh, the last week of November, because I would like to expand on that. Okay. So, uh, Michael, are you there? I am. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah, perfect. Let me Welcome to the video. show. Thanks for making it today. Yeah. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Hey, Mark. How's it going? Hey, Don. How are you? All right. So, Michael, uh, the three of us sat down last month at Beaver Creek and had an opportunity to talk a little bit about Aftermath. And um, you and I talked a little bit more about your other company that you founded, Vendetta. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, maybe you could start with Vendetta because I, you know, I know there hasn't been a ton of news there lately. 
Um, if you could kind of give us maybe just a one or two minute overview and on that, and then we can just run right into aftermath and then Don and I will ask you some questions if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Vendetta. Vendetta is located in Australia, in Queensland, which is one of the premier mining districts in Australia. It's a, a lead zinc project, and we currently have it defined as, I'm going to make sure I uh, look at the correct numbers, indicated 5.7 million tons and inferred at 8.2, uh, with the average grade combined about 9% lead zinc, which is really good. Uh, what it has going for it, it's in, in the heart of infrastructure. Uh, it's close to roads, power, uh, you know, we're a, a day from the port. So it has everything that you would want to see in a base metal project, except a market. And I, I think that's uh, a product of zinc has been um, pulled back in the last two years. And I think we've got a little bit of uh, pain ahead of us before we see some improvement in the price of, of the metal. Um, what we have going for us there, though, is we we still believe there's additional um, mineralization that we can add to our mine plan, and there's several people in the area that could use the feed. So I think uh, going forward, we're we're very bullish on Vendetta and uh, ex expect to have some announcements shortly. I, I think one of the things that we're looking at that I could would make a significant difference is to have more Australian exposure. The Australian markets have, uh, I would say, in the last four years, been a lot stronger than uh, the Canadian and North American markets. So the valuations are higher. So it might make sense uh, to do some form of arrangement, either with an Australian company or a uh, list on the ASX. Um, I, I think that from an engineering point of view, there's still uh, room to improve the deposit. Uh, so we put out a PEA several years ago. Uh, there's a, The next step would be to redo that bring it up uh, to today's standards and pricing and use uh, XRT sorting, which would improve the uh, grade and gets rid of the race waste rock, which makes it a, I think a stronger story going forward, but uh, I did very positive on it. Uh, other than I said at the beginning, uh, the, the market hasn't been really uh, a, a friend as of the last 24 months and any of the, the lead zinc stories, but you know, that's cyclical and will change as uh, everything does change. Uh, it's one of the few uh, lead zinc projects, I think, globally that uh, is on the cusp of going, you know, you could put it into production relatively quickly, given the uh, local infrastructure and, and where we sit with our uh, mine plan and such. As far as aftermath goes, that uh, we, we've had, a, you know, a couple good years of both uh, drilling and uh, some work behind the seats to advance that project. It's uh, it's focused in Chile with the Chayacoyo uh, deposit, which is primarily silver, and then in uh, Peru at uh, Berenguila, which is unquestionably our, our flagship. You know, our uh, silver numbers are, are stellar. We have one of the, the largest undeveloped silver assets uh, globally, followed by significant copper and uh, manganese could be a, a critical there. In fact, the value of the manganese could exceed the silver. And if you look at our previous 43101, which came out earlier this year, it does. And, and manganese is, is one of those metals. I think, I, I don't want to say it's having a renaissance, but it, it looks like the use of manganese is going to change dramatically from largely focused in the steel industry to both fertilizer and in the battery industry, critical metals. Uh, it's used now, or they're starting to use it. Volks Volkswagen, for instance, a big proponent of this, of using manganese at the expense of cobalt. There's a lot more manganese available and it's uh, significantly less expensive than cobalt. The challenge with manganese is, even though there's a lot of it globally, there's not a lot of the manganese, which is we define as manganese sulfate, which we would need to process in order to be used in the battery industry. MnSO4 is the um, the, the chemical for that. So, uh, but uh, we're doing our metallurgy. We should have an announcement out in the uh, next couple of weeks. Uh, we are trying to produce a battery grade. Uh, that is the sort of the uh, Valhalla, if you will, of of uh, 
of manganese, being able to do that. And uh, so far, so good. We like what we're seeing. Uh, certainly, we have enough of it. It's large, uh, <clears throat> large uh, mineralization. And uh, the, you know, the grade is certainly uh, good enough that it could be used as a battery grade. But the, the secret is, it all, all revolves around impurities and removing them. And that's what we're demonstrating now that we can produce a pure enough product that could be used in the in the battery um, in the battery business and for automotive. Interestingly enough, uh, like a lot of these type of metals, ninety two percent is uh, processed in in China, and we might have the scope at Barangila that you could put a, per, a processing facility somewhere in the Americas, maybe Peru or even in the United States and. The United States has made uh, manganese a critical metal, which is which is good to see. So it's it's gone in the right direction. Uh, we're currently focusing on metallurgy. Uh, next year we should have our PEA out, and then we'll go to pre feasibility study. Uh, we've got uh, I would say the world's preeminent silver investor, John Embry, is our lead shareholder, approximately fifteen percent. Uh, we also have uh, five percent of a. Uh, mid-tier silver producers. So we, we've got the, the right backing, uh, I think, you know, as I lamented on about Vendetta. Uh, once we start getting into more of a precious metal silver market, uh, we'll, we'll certainly be away to the races. And it has a significant copper component with it. So that, that's sort of Vendetta in a nutshell. Uh, we give the investors exposure to both silver, copper, and manganese. So uh, the, there's a lot going on there. Uh, the, the political situation in Peru has certainly improved since they, um, the previous president got impeached. It's come back to the center, which where it's been historically and where we, where we expect it to be. But uh, if, you, if you look at our 43101, you know, we're looking at about a 143 million ounces of silver with 101 in indicated category and in inferred uh, 38 million. So, you know, that that's not insignificant. That's a that's a big deposit. It looks like um, there's a good chance, excuse me, it'll be open pitable based, we, based on uh, our open pit constraint model we're using. And there's very few open pit silver ore bodies out there. And, and we have one of them. In fact, right. if you look at our other project in uh, Chile, we've got two. Fantastic. Um, Don, do you mind if I just ask one question and then turn it over to you? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, Michael, um, just on Vendetta, I just had one or two questions, and then I just had one or two on Aftermath. So on Vendetta, um, in Australia, close to infrastructure, you mentioned production. I I'm not going to hold you to a date, but um, would that be something within 16 to 18 months, in your view? or? Well, you, there, there is a mill within 44 kilometers of us that on paper – would work. And that company is in the, I think they're running a process to sell the, the company. It's called Chernova. The deposit's called Osborne. And Osborne is running remnants of a previous operation. I, and without, you know, putting words in their mouth, I think our deposit would give them an extra, you know, significant mine life and delay them going out of production there. So I think at some point, Hopefully sooner than later, there will be an opportunity. And that makes the most sense to use that, that mill. You know, it, it would save a lot of money, million, you know, tens of millions of dollars on the, the capital cost by using that mill and certainly impact the internal rate of return. And it, and it works for them. On that scenario, I, I think you could see it happening, you know, relatively quickly. You know, it depends what you mean in the mining industry. You know, 24 months is short term and, you know, midterm would be 24 to, you know, 48 and then beyond that's long term. So I think that that might be something you could expect uh, short to midterm. OK, you know, if, if things uh, fall into place. Great. And then on after <laughs> Um So the manganese components, um, you'd mentioned that there's a 43 101 on Berengia. When when was that released? Uh, that was March. March, okay. Yeah, and March, then you, of you're, sure. March of 2023. In the yep. PEA for next year, do you have a time frame for that? Uh, yeah, we're lo we're looking at uh, I think right now Q4. It it would be market dependent because if the markets 
uh, start to, to pick up a little bit, we might ramp up what we need to do. Now, most of that, I think, will be on the metallurgical side. Uh, if you look at our 43101, um, given the amount of ounces and tons we have, I, I don't think we need to add much more, if any. Uh, if you look at our mining method, this this uh, deposit comes close to surface. And, you know, I think your strip ratio would be very, very small. So from an engineering point of view, it's de-risk, geologically de-risk. We just need to demonstrate we can make the metallurgy work. And, you know, that that's usually the one of the key tenants on a base metal project is transportation and metallurgy. And fortunately, from... Uh, for our shareholders point of view, we're only six kilometers from rail. So we can bring that into, into Berengila and do, do a lot of things that way and save a lot of money. But uh, the, the last thing we need to demonstrate, we can make the met work. We can, you know, the idea is to produce a silver metal, to produce uh, copper cathode, like uh, copper sheets, sheets of copper, and also produce manganese sulfate. Um, and, and if we can produce those three things, we're way to the races. Even if we could produce two out of three, I, I think it would still work, but uh, I'm confident that we'll be able to produce all three. The Great. PEA will confirm that. Thank you for that. Um, one last thing, Don, and then I'll turn it over to you. I just wanted to touch on Peru because being that your two projects are in Chile and Peru, um, you know, Peru has changed a lot since uh Castillo was impeached right and and mm -hmm. what was interesting to me was for about 18 months prior to that you know your stock got smoked because of the Peruvian exposure like so many stocks but then it hasn't rebounded since that time for the fact that he is now no longer in power so if Peru is truly in the center right now um can you tell us a little bit about the interim leadership and and kind of like you know what your view is of Peru well, um, yeah, it was, the, and also concurrently with uh, Castillo taking power, which kind of took us all by surprise. And I think that compounded the market's reaction because we didn't expect a government that, and Castillo was, you know, comes from certainly the left side of, of the spectrum to, to win that election. And unfortunately, the right didn't, might not have had the most dynamic candidate that Peruvians wanted, but so it was like driving down the road and getting two flat tires at once, um, and you only have one spare. We're slowly clawing it back. But what's since happened is uh, Castillo was found to uh, be found guilty within their Congress of, of corruption and fraud and was significantly impeached. And the, the new government that came in is the same party. Now I met with the prime minister in Toronto in, in March at PDAC. And he said to us, uh, look, there's going to be significant changes. We're at a luncheon, uh, changes in Peru and everybody kind of, we looked at each other. Oh, he, he, I think he used the word reforms. And that's always scary when you're a mining company and you hear the word reforms. And he goes, uh, mining is our number one industry. We are not going to make it uncompetitive. Uh, we are going to help you with your permitting, which uh, looks like they have. And we're going to guarantee you the, the rights to access your deposits and ports and roads, which means at the time, the, the rural communities that supported Castillo were blocking a couple of uh, the, the, the roads. Those quickly came down. And there was a uh, Los Bombos, a big deposit there that was having some issues with the local people. They said th this uh, talk was on Tuesday and he said, look, by Thursday, there should be no further issues there. And uh, the army went in and uh, there were no further issues. They the protesters um, went away and we haven't had any real issues. Uh, the, the proof is always in the pudding, people uh, permitting things and moving forwards. But they're saying the right things. And so far, they're doing the right things. Uh, a, a significant amount of the GDP, I think it's 11% in Peru, is derived from mining. It's, I think it's the largest or second largest silver producer in the world. It's, it's I think, second or third on copper. It, it's a sig and significant gold producer. It is not going to, to change that culture. In fact, I just bid on another project there. I, I, 
I, I think Purdue's a, Peru is a great place to do business. It's got a mining history and uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll have a strong mining future. Excellent. Thanks for the update. Don, turn it over to you. Hey, Mike. Lots of hey, questions. Hey, Don. How you doing? Got a lot of questions for you. All right. So I'm going right to start off with Bering Gala's uh, resource size. So we're talking about man manganese. So what is it? And it's 140 million ounces of silver, but what is the silver yeah. equivalent when you add in the copper and the manganese? Well, <laughs> yeah. I yeah, I'm not supposed to use those those numbers be, because I, I'll tell you why, and, and then I'll answer your question. Um, if you're doing an equivalent, you're you're supposed to use the dominant metal. Now, if I if I break down the the value of of the ore body, and this goes back to the forty three one that we one we just announced, fifty percent of the value at forty nine fifty is is tied up in the manganese. And that's manganese as a fertilizer, and I believe we use five hundred dollars a ton. Um, we I think we use twenty two for silver and two seventy for copper there thereabouts. So we would have to convert everything to a manganese to do an equivalency. But I know people have said, and, and it varies depending on where you put the manganese price, but. Uh, you know, some people said it's up to half a billion silver ounces based on fertilizer. I would have to run those numbers to confirm them. And I certainly couldn't put them out on a, a public basis. We would have to do the, do the work on them. And But the, the securities commissions and the exchange doesn't like you to use uh, the, the junior metal, if you will, the one with the lesser amount of value as the equivalency. But you can see what it would be. It's, it's not insignificant. You know, I was looking at the, you know, top 10 undeveloped silver deposits that a, a group called the Visual Capitalists put out, and we're right in the middle of that. Uh, and that's just without adding in our, our copper values or manganese. That's based on just silver alone. So it's it, it's funny. Anytime there's a, a spike in the silver price, uh, you, you see a corresponding lift. And, and I think, John, you've probably noticed this, too in uh, aftermath and that's predicated on the people that follow us as a silver company the institutions that like us that we talk to are are keeping a keen eye on the manganese and they're all saying the same thing as soon as you've got your metallurgy done come talk to us and let's see what your specifications are it's 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 all about uh purity impurities purities and uh, co coming up with a commercial product in manganese. We're trying to be conservative. We're using $500 manganese as fertilizer, but if it was, you know, if we were to produce a product, you know, you're probably up around, uh, I'm just guessing 800 million ounces uh, silver equivalent. But once again, you, you know, as a disclaimer, you should, I shouldn't really use that because I'm using a, so I should be giving you a manganese equivalent but that's tough for people to understand what that means. I, I, I confess, I probably wouldn't even know what that meant. But I, I think it's safe to say, if you look about the amount of manganese produced worldwide, manganese sulfate, we would, um, we would be one of the bigger manganese uh, deposits worldwide. Okay, so yeah, so the reason why I asked that is because I, I don't invest for the near term, and mm -hmm. so. So I don't care about the current silver price. I, I always invest, focus down the road. So I'm looking three to five years down the road. What's the silver price going to be? So if, if we if we just if we if we just ignore that the manganese manganese portion, yeah. we just focus on the 140 million ounces of silver, and look at the possible free cash flow. So I, I like to use 100 dollars silver, but today I'll just use 75. I actually think we'll hit fifty dollars silver next year. So seventy five is for me is you know nothing. So right. if we look at seventy five, um, and we look at the silver, seven million ounces of silver. If if you use the manganese and the copper as offsets, your cash cost is going to be possibly negative, maybe a dollar, maybe two dollars, somewhere yeah. in there. It's going to be just ridiculous, right? So I would suggest, yeah. So even at fifty dollars silver. Which I think is really, really low. Your free cash flow is three hundred fifty million. If if your cash costs are zero, seven million times fifty is three hundred fifty million dollars. If you have cash costs 
if you have costs that are that low, you're going to get a, get get a good multiple. Even if you're in Peru, you're going to get at least a 10. So you take the 350 times 10, that's $3.5 billion. And that yeah. to me, that to me is worst case scenario. That to me is a conservative number. The value that if I value your company at 3.5 billion. Like you said, this is an easy mind to build. It's open pit. It's not going to cost a ton of money for a PEA. It's not going to cost a ton of money for a PFS. The engineering's there. It's it's a well-known, you know, we know how to do open pits. Um, we do know how to do open pits. So now we're going to get to, so we know we know the valuation's there. We know it's it's pretty tremendous. But you, yet today you're valued $34 million fully diluted. Um, yeah, what, you know, a couple things to bear in mind um, as, as far as the silver resource and in the measured NINDA category, a category is 101 million ounces. So the majority is in measured and indicated and will bring the inferred, which is another 38 point, what is it, 38.8 into that category. So it's not like it's inferred ounces either. The right. majority is, is measured and indicated. But the, the other thing to bear in mind, though, is I, I think the CapEx on this it won't be insignificant. Like this is going to be a big project. You know, I, the the goal is you, you want, you always want a 15 year mine life, but this could extend beyond it. But if you look at it, like you, you just said, you're, you're going to get the silver basically, I would think for free, as long as we can produce uh, copper and, and manganese, just the copper alone might pay for a good majority of the, of the uh, silver or and the manganese uh, as well but right. you know I'll, I'll be able to answer those questions well, correctly we knew, with right, the well, level. right well my point was that that your company is incredibly undervalued that's that yeah, i know we all say that i'm just i'm just showing you kind of the baseline the valuation it could go it could be higher that's my baseline again I, well, I value companies at $100 silver. Once you go to $100 silver, it goes crazy. But but now now let's get to before you say anything. I'm, now we need. I want to talk about red flags. Yeah. You know, for me, I have like five checklists for development companies. The yep. first one is you know is it cheap? So I made that point pretty pretty clear. Right? That's fair. Yeah. It's absolutely cheap, right? The second one is path to production, and I think. You've kind of laid that out because you, you talked about you're going to have a PEA next year and then a PFS after that. Now, yep. the because of the tech, the engineering that's required for open pits, it's not going to be that difficult to go from PEA to PF, PFS. It's not like we have to wait a year for it. It's it's going to come no. fast and furious. So the, the path to production is there. How long will it take to permit this? Twenty four months or, or less? No, it wouldn't be like to, for production. No, how long will it take to permit it? For, for it to go into production from say no no, uh, no 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 when you start permitting when you start permitting how long will it take you to complete permitting? Uh, probably tw twenty four months, I would think. That's, that's exactly. What, that's exactly that's what the Peruvians are saying they want to to bring. Yes. You know, we used to say twelve months, but you know now it's probably twenty four. Um, uh, that's right. That's that's exactly with my target twenty four months. So the past. You know, we, the production, production, path to production. That we need to get my other three buckets in. So we'll see if you're, we'll see if you're a buy or not, right? So the the third one is management. Well, okay, well, okay. does your does your management team have the ability? You said the capex is going to be significant. Yeah. Does your company, your current management team, have the ability to build and operate this mine? Yeah, my yes. To answer your your question, my, Michael Parker, who's our uh, chief operating officer was the country manager for First Quantum. And, and Mike's essentially put the, the team together down in Peru. Uh, it's it's more development exploration orientated now, but he's capable of putting together a team that can build a mine. And, and as a junior company with a, a big deposit like this, you have to be capable of putting something into production and you, you have to demonstrate to the market that you're going to, because if you can't, these other companies just sit on the sideline waiting for you to screw up and then come in there and uh, take over your asset at a significant discount. We have 
as management, we have a challenge. Well, it's not a challenge, I think. It, it's more a decision to make at, at the feasibility level. Is this a company maker? Do we go to production? Or do we, I, I expect to get offers at both pre-feasibility and feasibility level because there's not many deposits like this worldwide, very few. So, right. you know, we, we're already under non-disclosure with several mining companies that are wanting in our data room now and, and following along on the network. So right. I would think they, it's a type of deposit that would be attractive to other companies. So we have to make a decision, do we sell it at that point or do we go into to production? You have really? to be capable. Right. So going into production. To, to, to me, that just flashing red flag. I, I don't want to hear that at all. And that's going to be one of my buckets. So we're going to get there. But I think one of the reasons why you're so cheap right now, so valued, is that the market doesn't really believe that your your heart's into it, basically building this mine. And, it, and this comes down to the to my to my next bucket. And that's yeah, yeah. and that's insiders. I want yes. for develop. I, you know, my experience has been whenever a company is highly undervalued and they don't have a significant number of insiders, especially a, a one, at least one strategic investor who basically is in it for the long haul, those companies get taken out. And that's the worst case. Now, again, I said that you're, you know, valued at, you know, 3.5 billion minimum, right? So you're, mm -hmm. you're basically, you know, 30 to 50 bagger here. So you're once you throw the metallurgy out, once you throw that PEA out and people start running the numbers, they're going to go, geez, let's go, we want to, we want to buy this company. Mm -hmm. so, so here's my bucket, here's my checklist. You know, who's the strategic investors? Do you have 30% today of your investors yes. that, won't, that won't sell? Yes. Well, you, you know, I'm I, I don't deem to speak for Eric Sprott, but I, I know that. Eric would understand that if we have additional value to come or we're undervalued, say, at the PFS or the feasibility level, that he's not going to sell. Now, if, if it's if an offer came in that's stunning and made sense, we do look at the pro forma, see how much dilution we would incur and see if it makes sense for the shareholders. But just to answer your previous question where you, you, you weren't sure you didn't hear the answer you wanted to. My, my answer was both, look, we're capable of putting it into production. That's not, wouldn't be difficult. We just ramp up, get the right people. But I can't answer that question without seeing uh, PFS numbers because that largely dictates the strategy at, at that point. If someone came in, you know, I, if someone came in and made us an offer that shareholders would could get, say, 80% of the, of the full value rather than weight, it, it might make sense to take that 80%. We'll make that decision at that time. But right. the, every now and then there's a deposit that is so rich. And if the manganese turns out that it can be a uh, battery grade, and if the silver price is a fraction of what you say, I if it's $30, the, the free cash flow is would be stellar on this project. At $30, not 50, not 100. Yes, uh, you yeah. would put it into production yourself. It would just it would just produce cash hand over fist. Right. It, the, right. My issues here is that it doesn't like sound like your board. Now you mentioned Eric Sprott, but I, I didn't get a number though. Do you? How much does he have, and how much? Again, Eric, Eric has fifteen percent. Right. Okay. Great. Fantastic. So, do you have another fifteen percent? I found that if you have thirty percent insiders, nobody's gonna nobody's gonna try to take you out. Do you have yeah, our, our insiders like we have a, a relatively small board and between Ralph myself, I think we're might be up to about 7%, but we have a couple key family offices in Europe that are very close to us, they would vote with management. So I, I'm sure we be probably well over that threshold, Clo probably Perfect. closer to 40. And right. just one I, sec, one sec, Don. didn't you say, Michael, that you had John Embry and, and a mid-tier silver company too? Oh, it's not John Embry. It was oh, I, I mentioned John, um, or pardon me, Eric Sprott, uh, who used to work with uh, John Embry at Sprott Asset Management. Um, gotcha. Yeah, sorry, your your question was? Well, I was just trying to do the math. If we're getting, trying to get the Don's 30%, if you're saying Eric's at 15, you and, and the CEO Ralph are at seven, 
the mid tiers at five. I mean, that gets you to twenty seven right there. Look, my 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 European family offices are probably at ten or fifteen, and th okay. those are people that a believe in the sector and have have made a, a lot of money with myself in the past. So why they, they yeah. largely take direction from from us. You yeah. can't always count on people. Things things change, but I think they would go with us. All right. So, yeah. So, I mean, you're checking the boxes. The other, the lead, last check box is location. I don't think Peru's a problem. I mean, if you're in the DRC, it's a no-go, right? But Yeah, DRC is for me. Uh, anywhere where you have to protect your property with an AK-47, no-go. <laughs> so, Peru's, Peru's, yeah, Peru's fine for me as long as your lo the locals are okay with it. If you don't have any issues with the locals, then you're you're good to go. Okay, well, here, here's the thing, Don. I I would say if any junior company tells you they don't have permitting issues, they're not being forthright. In our industry today, we all, and if you have a significant ore body, you're always going to have issues because NGOs get involved. Now, the, the way to handle an NGO is that, to your point, you have the local people on side. And we've got a town, uh, Santa Lucia, six kilometers away. Now, it, you know, there's a there's a statue of a miner in the middle of town. So that's that's a good sign. And a lot of the people from that town work at some of the local mines and they they would work with us. Now, the one of the problems that we have, if you look at a map, we're in southern Peru. There's a river that goes literally right by the, the ore body. It's almost like a, a three wood away. Now, we get water for drilling from there. But in mining, if you... Uh, the water you produce from a mine has to go in either to tailings or dry stack. It becomes a flashpoint because the people that don't like mining and their raison d'etre is to stop it, aka the, the NGOs, use that as an excuse to fight you. But what we have is, being that we have rail six kilometers away, um, you, we're, we're, this is what we're thinking now. This is, uh, and it would come out in a PEA, PFS. Rather than uh, process on site, we pro process down on the coast and in an industrial area, suddenly those water problems disappear, which means that we shouldn't, you know, on paper have any permitting problems because we're, we're not going to have, there's not going to impact any of the rivers by Barangila or local communities. So from that point of view, we're very lucky. Okay, so now... What I'm going to say next is the most important part of this whole conversation. I um, Right now, I have basically 10 development projects that are my favorites that check all the yeah. boxes. You're not on that list. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you why you're not on the list. And you should be on the list. And the only reason you're not on the list is the real, well, I'll explain why. So number one, you're not giving guidance to the market of what you're going to do. People are confused. Mm -hmm. Your your company presentations from March. It should be from August. You should be updating that every single month. You need to tell the market what you're going to do. You have you check all the boxes. You have the shareholders. Your company's worth north of one billion dollars all day long. Potentially. Uh, no, 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 no. The prices, you need to, to see what's coming with silver. You can't be pricing your company out at, at $25 silver. That's ridiculous. You got to think, well, the, you have to you, think about, you have to think about what's coming. You can't ignore it. Too many companies ignore the future and, and they, oh, price silver is going to stay at 25 forever. And think in that term, you can't think like that. That's wrong. Well, I don't think I don't think Michael thinks like that. I mean, I don't want to put well, your mouth. Well, well, no, well, yeah. Let me get to my point though. The reason why you're not on my list is companies that know what they have, they tell everybody what they got. They basically, you know, we we have an unbelievable project here that's unbelievably valued, and we're taking this thing to production. And this is our steps. Here, here's the thing. You, you should have done a PEA a long time ago. Now, I get the fact that manganese held you up. Because of the manganese issue, you had to get the metallurgy right. You didn't want to do a PA without it. I get all that. that, that that's fine. But you still could have done one and did some hypotheticals in there and said, look, okay, this is these are, these are the possibilities. But the, the key here, yeah. the key here is that 
we need to have an understanding that your company is passionate passionate about what you have and where you're taking it. That's the key. Now, here's another one. Here's some of the red flags. The reason yeah, yeah. my top 10 list, and you should be on there. Um, I'm concerned about a reverse split. Your your cash levels, you haven't mentioned your cash levels. I mean, you should you should be telling me what you're going to do. This is how much cash we have. This is where we're going. This is how much I need to raise. So your cash levels are low. Um, you can, t after you know, answer your question, you can tell me about your cash levels. Yeah. The, 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 issues, the issue here is I want your company to basically giving me guidance about where you're going. For instance, your your presentation should have years on it. 2023, 2024, we're going to do a PEA. 2025, we're going to do PFS. 2026, we're going to do permitting. 2027, we're going into production. That should be a huge slide telling me that's what companies do when they when I get a gut feeling that this company is taking this thing to production, they're not for sale. You need to tell the you need to tell everybody we're not for sale, we're not for sale. But what you told me was when the PFS comes out, we'll decide which way we're going to go. And you know that that really is a, a big red flag to me. Now I'm a tough interviewer. I, I ask very. No, 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 it's all good. Look, so, I, I've sold companies before. But I want you. I want you to be. I want you to get on my top ten list. I want to be able to tweet you out and say this company is a slam dunk. You need to own it. There, and I can send. I tell you these companies that I absolutely love. That I just know they're taking these projects to pr production. Those are the ones I love. You have the insiders. There's no reason why your only problem is your guidance. You're not, and again, like I said, your company presentation should be up to date every single month. Um, that's important to me because that shows me your passion. But got it. All right. So okay, I, I think we we made a mistake because we our last presentation is September, and I think we forgot to put that up on the website. I was traveling. I'm back now, but no excuses. But you're you're right there. But those points that you talk about, our latest presentation uh, doesn't include those. We've got a timeline. It, don't forget, we've only had this project, let's call it, you know, 36 months. And the first little bit was right in the heart of COVID. So we couldn't get on the ground. From an engineering point of view, we, we drilled 60 holes ourselves. We had to do that in order to put a 43-101 out. All the heavy lifting's been done for a, a PEA, but we have to do certain metallurgical things. And we can't afford a misstep because when we first put out that metallurgy, it better be tight and almost foolproof. So we're a little, we're a bit afraid about making mistakes. So we were doing every, ticking every box internally. The other thing that it, it's a little harder from an investor point of view, but our, we've had handcuffs on because of the securities uh, requirements and, and what the exchanges will allow us to say. I have to be careful. I can't even say the word or yet. I have to say mineralization. I can't add my indicated to my inferred. That's why earlier when you and I were talking, I, I gave those out to you. Um, th there's a lot of things that you would like to see that I would like to say that I can't yet. I will be at the PEA level. And, and believe me, when I can, I'll put my foot on the gas. That's that's when you'll see us, you know, throw everything at this. But we, we've done all the, there's over 300 drill holes into this project now. You know, I think there's, uh, I think 380 to be exact. Uh, we've done the last 60. There's a few drill holes that we we might uh, still do in order to to bring it up and in, further into indicated. But there wasn't enough or in indicated that the engineers would have allowed to put out a proper PEA. And one of the things, and, and this is what I think from an in industry uh, perspective, is. Um, once you put out a PEA, it better be tight and as, as good as it's going to get because it's tough to come back and say, oh, by the way, that PEA, we've improved on it. Um, pe people tend to think that's that's what you have. It wasn't ready for a PEA until now. And, and we're doing we're ostensibly in PEA mode now, but we're just doing the metallurgical side of that first. So it's de-risk geologically from an engineering point of view, which you've, you've picked up on, but now I need to demonstrate the, the network. And bearing in mind, manganese used to be perceived 10, 15 years ago as pejorative because it, it caused problems from a metallurgical point of view. It kind of gummed up the works, if you will. 
the the technology has significantly changed. We're using hydrometallurgical technology, which is like a giant chemistry set. But so far, everything looks like it's it's going in the direction we'd like. We have to be very sure that that we can uh, make that work. Um, so you just made a two point five million dollar payment for the Barangila property um, early. Where did you get that cash, and how much cash do you still have? How much are you going to raise in your next financing? Okay, so this is what I'm thinking. Um, and and we, we didn't have to make that. We had a $2.5 million payment U.S. Uh, the end of November this year. Last January, I said to the board, look, I think there's a window right now. Uh, let's raise $5 million, make that payment early. And that essentially gives us a 24-month uh, window before any property payments. And that's what we did. I raised $8 million. There was a, a strong appetite. I, I closed the financing, I believe, at the beginning of May. And the, the financing window closed probably in June. I, I would have a tough time today raising $8 million. And if I'd be doing it, it, it wouldn't be at $0.25. Cents. So what I would like to do is might do a, a small financing between now and PEA just to top it up. Uh, you know, sort of a million, two million max. When that PEA comes out, and I think it, and I'm assuming we will demonstrate the that we can make the manganese work. And if we can make it certainly work at uh, the battery grade level, and we'll, we should be able to demonstrate we can produce through Merrill Crow a silver, silver Doré and um, through SXEW cathode copper uh, versus by electrolysis. We, I would like to do a large financing at that point of the $30 million and then we're done. Then we, we're going to, way through PFS on our way to production. Once we demonstrate to the market, we can do that. But I think we'll be an institutional story then because I've ticked off everybody's box and the big one is met, but I'm getting there, almost there. You have 8 million in warrants that are expiring in November. Are you gonna extend those or will they go away? Uh, no, I extended them. Okay, so those and are... the, and the reason I extended them, they're key shareholders. You know, we we mentioned those people that that we would need to to be there with us. Uh, okay. they're, they're certainly one of them. Um, my last question: um, Will you uh, not do a, a reverse split? Uh, there's no plan. I I don't think we need to. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm not a fan of that. Thanks for uh, taking all those tough questions. I really oh, appreciate it. Those are good. I, I'm, I'm actually glad you asked, asked me them. Okay. Thanks and, a lot, Michael. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me, guys. I'll make and, sure uh, our uh, September presentation's up on the site. That's great. Yeah, thanks for doing that. One last thing, Michael. Could you just, uh, would you mind looking at the pres real quick and just telling us what slide the timeline is on? Yeah, it was actually, while I was doing that, I was looking for it. Um, oh, okay. Like I just closed it. I think on the the new one up tomorrow, it's like slide twenty eight. But let me let me see if I can back in the back of the I'll presentation. Look it up. Okay. Yeah, it's it's on it's so towards the the back of. I did uh, have after Berengula. Yeah, I did have one final comment, and that is this: is that twenty three. Once 23. you once you release that PEA, I think that gives you the opportunity to change basically the the whole pitch of your company. It's like that once that once you have your hands on that PEA, because that PEA is going to show you how much you're going to produce. You know, it's going to give you an idea, right? So once you have that number, once you have those numbers, you can actually change the entire tone of your company is, hey, we got a very, we got a profitable project here. We're taking it to production. Once you get that, once that word gets out, Aftermath is heading to production. I think, I think your company goes up 5X. Well, Don, that, that's what we think internally as well, because we'll be, I don't think people appreciate how big this ore body, and we're just talking Barangila, forget Chayakoyo. Um, I, I don't think people appreciate, if, if I just look at it as a silver company, it's large. Uh, it's okay as a copper company as a standalone, and it could impact the manganese um, industry. It's it's that big. If I, I tell people, and we put this out publicly, so I'm happy saying it. We were 100, you know, you've seen the breakdown uh, on the silver. Um, 
that's only 25% of the value of, of the, of this potential mine. Yeah. People don't believe you're going to build it right now. That's why. No, well, we, we can we look with, with Michael Parker, he's, he's done at first quantum's one of the biggest copper companies in the world. And he was a senior executive there where we're capable of it. What we would do is we'd muscle up the board and we bring in guys that have built mines at that point, maybe even at the PFS level, because I think you made the comment earlier, it'll go quickly. Most of the work will be done. So what you do at PFS, you might, you know, look at it and go, okay, well, if we need to drill these 20 drill holes, it'll increase our measured and indicated. And then you go to your uh, resource and a uh, reserve and, and that's all you need to do. Then, then it's game on. And, right. and I think if you couple that with a good market, there's very few opportunities like this. And you, very right. I think when your PA comes out, we'll be over thirty dollars silver. So your company is going to be right on the, you know, everybody's going to be looking at you. There's less than ten projects in the world over seven million ounces a year, you know, on the board right now. There's very few. Your your project's rare. And yeah, well, yeah, you know, and then what? You've got the other metals too. Yep, That's exactly. Great. Yeah, yeah. No, no, we're like you. You almost wonder as management sometimes. You start to second guess. Am I missing something? What? Why isn't this trading higher? But we all say that in the I've, junior I've industry. I'm telling you the reason. It's it, it's yeah. it's in it, you know the, the issue. You know, it took you a long time to do the PEA, and so until that comes out, nobody cares. Uh, that's a fair comment, and we and we knew that when we picked up the asset. You know, just just to finish off, I the way I look at these things, and I look at it from a corporate view is not so much 30, 40, 50, 60 dollars silver. You know, how do these things work if silver falls back? And can you still go forward? And and that's one of the reasons we like Baron Gala a lot, because you you would anticipate lower operating costs given where the your uh, potentially open pit. You know, I I think that's where the silver industry's fallen down. High grade underground operations that when silver pulled back, they didn't make money and had to shutter. This is a type of approach, and that's why I think other companies will love this. When, but you know, it's it's great to be loved. Yep, I, I was done, but I have one other thing. I, I actually think a merger between you and Silver X is gonna would be a beautiful combo. Well, we've we've been already offered to merge with bigger companies, so. <laughs> but I like the so you know what I do like the Silver X guys, and I, I like their projects. Well, you're both, uh, you're both in Peru. That's where it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. No, there's some, look, there's going to be some good synergies as this market improves. You know, we, we've been doing all of this in a terrible market and you guys have been doing your thing in, in a bad market. We've forgotten what a good market does and what it what it can do. And uh, projects like this and some of your other clients, I, I think, uh, you know, you'll be asking me, why am I trading so high? How do I justify the valuation? And that's a good, good problem to have. Right. Hey, I thank you Absolutely. for your time, Mike. This, is, this has been a good interview. Yeah, thanks, guys. I, I appreciate you taking the time with me. Yeah, of course, Michael. Appreciate it. And um, we'll um, talk to you. Well, I'll talk to you in Zurich next uh, few weeks. Uh, yeah, we'll, see, we're I'll at see the that. Precious Metal Summit Conference there. Uh, so, keep... yeah, uh, you know, that would be before my next interview with Don. So I'll I'll have some new uh, notes potentially for uh, our next uh, get together. So, okay. Um, Michael, thanks again for coming on. Why don't thanks, you guys. drop off and then uh, Don and I will close it and uh, I'll be in touch with you soon. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye, Mike. You too. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, Don. So uh, really great good. job on the questions there. I think you brought up some some valid points. Um, you know, I, you know we, we do look at things a bit differently. You're looking longer term than I am, right? So I'm looking always, I, I, one of the key things I look for is leverage to the price of the metal that that company is trying to find. And some gold stocks and some silver stocks just don't move much when that metal pops, right? Like they just don't have the torque um, because sometimes they're hedging or some, you know, whatever the perception from the investing public, there's a number of factors at, at play. But with the aftermath, all I can say is when silver moves, this thing does move like Michael said and and that's what I like about it is that it makes me feel like you know when silver does run like you think it's going to run this is going to be a name people will start to recognize and if a PEA is less than a year away 
Like, why wouldn't you be buying it here at 13 cents? Like, why wait for it to be at 20 or 25? I hear that all the time from clients. Like, I want confirmation. Okay, but I mean, they, they just got done telling you they have 140 million ounces of yeah. silver and that has nothing to do with the manganese. So it's like, do you believe in silver? Yes or no is sort of the way I look at it. Oh yeah, as an optionality play, this thing's a slam dunk. I would say, you know, a very conservative number is 350 million ounces of silver equivalent. He mentioned, you know, 500 to 800 million. So they're currently valued at 34 million. So if we just say 340, you know, just throw in a round number. They're valued at 10 cents an ounce. Well, I firmly believe Hopefully. that companies like this will be valued at at least a dollar an ounce. So it's it's basically nine, you know, a nine bagger just on optionality alone. And the optionality could grow from there. I mean, they're they're not done drilling these two projects. I think they're going to get bigger. Right. So, you know, you throw some more numbers on there. And then I think that when silver gets above 50, I think these things are going to be selling for two dollars an ounce, which is kind of insane. That means this things like a 15 to 20 bag are just on optionality. What I mean by optionality, I mean, is they, if they sell it. Right. So they, they could sell this thing if they, if, they just, if they just do nothing, if they just sit on it and do nothing and just wait for the price of silver to go up, it's worth, you know, 15 to 20. It's, it's crazy. And see that, you know, so here, here's my whole problem with Aftermath is that I get a gut feeling about companies what they're doing and what they're going to do. For me, guidance, remember I, I went over the checklist of things I look for for companies. Then the, the most important one, may, well, they're all super important, but the one that, you know, that really kind of is kind of the, the one that really shows me if I'm interested or not is the path to production. Mm -hmm. And the path to production to me is not only company guidance, but what they've told me, you know, my gut feeling about the company you know, if you got if you got the cat by the tail, if you know what you're going to do, you let everybody else know. And mm -hmm. I get you know, you've probably done this. No, you just get the feeling that this is their plan. Does does a company have a plan? You know, when he says when we get the PFS, uh, uh, then we'll kind of decide that to me is just a huge red flag. That means that they really don't have a grip on what they have, what they're going to do. Maybe they maybe they do, they're just not talking. And maybe they're just not eloquently telling us. But I want a company that's really eloquent about what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. Those are the companies I just absolutely love. You get into those because, you know, like Ascendant, the one you showed me, that's a perfect example. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Ascendant resources. When, the, when I, you know, I checked all the boxes off, but if you go and you look at their presentation or if you go talk to their IR guy, I mean, that guy just drips. We're taking this thing to production, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, I got interviewed just, this week and I forget where, where it was. It's not out there yet. So I, I, I can't really, all I, all I you, said was, you, you know, at six cents, it's just a flyer. Like, you know, <laughs> give me a break. Like, you, right. You know, well, when you, when you compare those two companies, as far as guidance, just guidance only, just guidance. When you compare them, you we interview them, we interview. There's a there's an, it's a night and day difference. After math, you get the feeling they're just tr still trying to figure it out. I mean, when he told me that he thought it might make sense to sell this thing, I'm going, are you what? There, most of your shell are, shells are down over fifty percent. The the stock's down ninety percent. So who's going to make money off a sale? Well. To, to defend Michael on that point, I, I I know him pretty well as a we're 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 closer than most CEOs I am. You know, I have so many CEOs that I talk to, but I've talked to Michael pretty much monthly, and he had a good exit on Underworld, where you know they put about twenty nine million in, and they got a Kinross purchase for about one hundred and thirty mil. So like that was you know what is that a, a four bagger plus. You know, um, that's not what you're in it for. I get it. So, so is Michael looking for a four bagger here? I, I really don't think so. Berenke is a different project than that was. Yeah. He understands what he has in the ground. It's sort of like, reminds me of you and I were talking at dinner about America's gold and silver. And, you know, to Darren's credit, he, he could have pushed real hard and, and produced all, of, well, not all that silver, but a lot of the silver over the last three to four years. And instead didn't, he didn't do right. anything with it. I, you know, and so now you're sitting pretty, I think, at, and the stock is just getting killed. 
I mean, this 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 environment reminds me so much of January of 2016 with a much better geopolitical and economic backdrop for silver and gold, doesn't it to you? I mean, it's just, right. it's like the short interest is the only component I see differently. The short interest in Jan of 16 was very high. If you looked at Hecla and, and First Majestic, they were all 10 to 12% short. That is not the case right now. But there is a lot of naked shorting going on, meaning that people are shorting a stock in between those two monthly reads and then covering. I mean, we saw that October 13th. Yeah. Look at a lot of juniors. Aftermath itself was up, I think, 13 or 14% that day. It's like there's there's an amazing amount of torque when gold and silver run to a stock like Aftermath. For me, it means less to me than it does to you that they're going to go into production. I totally get that. But like for me, I'm just looking at it as a value manager and saying at 13 cents, this is like got, you know, one of the most undeveloped like projects in silver globally. I, I mean, Michael said top 10, let's say it's top 20, who cares? Like it's it's like unbelievable the amount of ounces in the ground that you're getting access to I, for so cheap. Yeah, I, I definitely own it. I definitely added to it. No, this is no, this is what I'm doing is trying to educate people. Um, yeah. Just showing you this That's is the flag, this is the red flag for the company. And it shouldn't exist. They're they're doing this to themselves. I believe in the yeah. company. I think it's a slam dunk five bagger all day long. But I don't think they're going to sell. I don't think they want to sell. And but the problem is that they need to they need to eloquently say that. Like, yeah. they're like we're too cheap. This is ridiculous. We're not we're not we're not we're not for sale here. That's what they they yeah. need. They just, like when you go to Zurich, he better he needs to say that. He needs yep. to say, you know, we're way under value. Our stock price is down 90%. We have strong shareholders. I mean, this is what he needs to say. He needs to let people know this is our plan. This is what we're going to do. I'm just, you know, I'm just yep. saying this is the, right the company. But this thing's got all kinds of green flags, absolutely, all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've, we've, in this presentation, in this podcast, we definitely showed you know the upside potential of this company is off the charts. There's very few companies, very few stocks that have this kind of leverage. Yeah, because a lot of a lot of companies will, will use marketing and fluff. You know, whether it's gold or silver, it doesn't matter to to market something that isn't that real. Or the jurisdiction, you know, has issues that you, you can't even see at, at, at this point in time. But Michael's always been honest, as well as Ralph, the CEO, to me about, hey, this is what's happening in Chile. This is what's happening in Peru. I mean, those guys were updating me, Don, every single month when Castillo was in office. So I asked them to. I was like, tell me about developments because I'm seeing, you know, Buenaventura, all these Peruvian stocks are getting smoked and there's got to be a buy in here somewhere, you know, and, and that's how we got interested in Silver X. You brought that one up. Um, same thing, like, you know, just just getting smoked. And then all of a sudden it just, you know, when, when Castillo got uh, dealt with in December of last year. That's when I put a position on with with uh, Jose's company as well. You know, it's like that thing ran real hard in 2023 before it pulled back. You know, mostly due to financing, I think. But right, yeah, I think uh, buying the stock is 13 cents is a no brainer. I don't think I think it's bouncing on the bottom. I mean, maybe it goes to 10 cents, but so what? You know, it's going to a dollar. So. Exactly. Yeah, we always talk about that's something we can always bring up. Uh, in future interviews too is risk reward, you know, because I think, like you said, at 13, absolutely, the, the low is around 10 and a half. So can it test that low? Sure, you've got downside risk, but look at the upside, you know, that's mm -hmm. what you have to look at as well. Like when people ask me, what do you think about, um, you know, NVIDIA or something? I'm like, well, the, the thing's trading at $411. I don't know what my, my uh, upside is, but I sure as hell know what my downside is because I can look at a five and 10 year chart, right? And it's like, yeah. That's scary. I'm not touching that right now with a 10 I, Right. I wish you would have let those uh, warrants expire. I think that's the risk you take when you invest. Um, but, you know, like basically saying, you know, a lot of people that I, I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of those warrants are owned by the board and those who are, you know, it's, it's, and they extend it for themselves. And that's that's kind of bad. I don't know if that's the case here. But I always I like, I was I like, look into that. I'll, I'll look up the PR and that's something we can talk about next time. But I just, um, yeah, that's, a, I, that's I, a good point you bring up too, because a lot of companies will disclose like X amount of warrants, but you really have to look under the hood to kind of determine. I, yeah, know, what I, I, I just think you know you you took the risk and the warrants expired. See ya, you know that's the way it should work. That's the way it should work. It's yeah. 
you shouldn't protect. So they're just protect, they're protecting a small number of shareholders for the larger whole because the larger whole benefits if those shares go away. Yeah, um, I'm making a note right now to, to ask Michael as a follow-up question when I see him in yeah. Zurich. So by the uh, time we it, get together. It's, not, it's only 8 million. It's it's not even, you know, 5%. It's it's a small number, but it, it's the tone, you know. It, yeah. it shows you how how investor-friendly they are or not. Um, because, if you know, if somebody bought those warrants, they already have shares too. The, the warrants come with shares. And so if those shares are worth mm -hmm. a fortune, you know, so what if I lost my warrants? But I'll also just point out, though, too, like when you talk about shareholder friendliness, I think a lot of mining companies intend, you know, they have good intentions. But Michael actually has picked up the phone to a number of my clients and, and done handholding like he really has. And and I can tell you that some of the guys that I that follow me with 20 million, 50 million, these guys are appreciative of that because they they're businessmen, too. Right. They own small businesses or large businesses and. They appreciate it when someone picks up the phone and says, "Hey, I I know you you know you may have some concerns here. Here's what's going on." Yeah, I mean, he definitely answers your questions uh, clearly. He doesn't sidestep them. I like that. So he's a, yeah. he's a straight shooter, that's for sure. And I and I'm you know I like the company. Um, I added shares. Um, I I really think it's going to be a game changer. Fingers crossed when they bring out the PEA when people see. The amount of free cash flow that thing, the potential this thing has, um, I think it's going to be a game changer, and the stock's going to just blast off from where it's at today. I think it jumps to one hundred fifty million. If we're at, we're over thirty dollars silver, and they bring out a solid PEA, I think I think it trades at one twenty one fifty is my expectation. So, uh, market cap. So the market cap today is what thirty four. Thirty four. Okay, so that's a. Four bagger, five bagger. Yeah, just on the PEA and the silver price going over thirty. Okay. Okay. Don, thanks again for everything.